Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Few important announcements. Number one, your geography this week, economy this week, and a detailed video lecture on the recent IPCC report on climate change. All these three video lectures are ready and shall be available on our YouTube channel within two days. Number two, if you want to enroll for anthropology optional classes, please fill in this form with your details. The link to this form is provided to you under the comment section. Further, if you want to enroll for our IAS tab program, and what is this IAS tab program? All the topics, subtopics that are mentioned in your prelims and main syllabus. For that, video lectures are recorded and are delivered to you in the form of a Lenovo tablet. So if you want to enroll for that GSIS tab, please fill in this form along with your details. If you need any guidance from Baiju's IAS, which may be regarding your optional selection, which may be regarding current affairs, which may be regarding reading newspapers, which may be regarding your preparation strategy, Please fill in this form with your details and our counselors shall get back to you. If you want any further guidance or help from Baiju's IAS, we are happy to help you. Just fill in this form along with your details and our counselors and mentors shall get back to you as soon as possible. So these were some of the important announcements that I had to make. Now let's get started with the newspaper analysis for today, beginning with Supreme Court warns high courts over vacancies. Now let's look at this newspaper article in slight detail. We have crores of cases pending in different courts in this country, be it Supreme Court or high courts or subordinate courts, district courts. What is the principal reason? The principal reason is that our judges to population ratio is abysmal. As per various estimates, India should have one judge for every 50,000 population and that would require more than 23,000 more judges in this country. So that is one problem. Since we have insufficient number of judges in the judiciary, that is why we have so much pendency of cases in our judicial system. Not only that, even where posts are created, we see that these posts are lying vacant. Recruitment has not taken place and that is why we see that there is vacancy in large numbers in our subordinate judiciary. And that is another reason why we have so many cases pending in our judicial system. If we go by the Supreme Court estimate, Supreme Court says that there are close to 5,000 judicial posts which are lying vacant in lower judiciary. But in lower judiciary, which is the recruiting agency? If we look at all the states in this country have their respective state public service commissions. This state public service commission in association with the concerned high court, they start the recruitment process, they conduct the examination and members to the lower judiciary are recruited. For example, district judges are recruited. And even below district judges, we see posts are created by the state governments and these posts are filled by the state governments through their own selection process. But what Supreme Court is saying that high courts and the respective state governments, they are not working in tandem and they are not in a position to fill these vacancies that have arisen. And what Supreme Court has now done, it has cautioned the high courts and the state governments that get your act together, fill these more than 5,000 judicial posts that are lying vacant in the lower judiciary. If you won't do that, then we will resort to a centralized selection mechanism. What is this centralized selection mechanism? We don't know. Maybe it is just a warning sign or signal given by the Supreme Court to the high courts and state governments that if you don't get your act together and fill these vacancies, then we will take over your responsibility and on our own, we will start this recruitment process and fill these more than 5,000 vacancies that are there in different states of this country. So this is a warning, a very important warning given out by the Supreme Court of this country. Now let's look at something else. 
461 elephants electrocuted in the country in eight years since 2009. Now let's look at this newspaper article in detail. If you look at India, India is home to largest number of Asiatic elephant. If we go by 2002 census, 2002 census said that there are 26,000 Asiatic elephants in this country. Five years later in 2007, the census said we have 27,000 Asiatic elephants in this country. That means an increase of 1,000 elephants over a period of five years. But does that mean all is well? No. There are two problems that still persist with these Asiatic elephants. Number one, we see the problem related to poaching. Number two, loss of habitat. If you look at poaching, elephants are killed for ivory, which is very expensive in the international trade. But one important detail that you need to know regarding ivory is that in Japan, from this ivory, hankos are made. What are these hankos? These hankos are personal seals. And these personal seals are worn, are used by the privileged in Japan. Another important detail from your prelims point of view is that only male elephants have tusks and that is why they are called tuskers. And Odisha is the state which has the largest number of tuskers in this country. Although Karnataka is the state which has the highest number of elephants in this country, but Odisha is the state which has the highest and largest number of tuskers in India. Few other important details that you need to know. Only 5% of the original habitat of elephants remain. When we talk about two problems surrounding Asiatic elephants, one is poaching, the other is loss of habitat. And I'm telling you only 5% of the original habitat of elephants remain. And even this 5% is fragmented. How this 5% habitat is fragmented? We are constructing highways through the habitat of elephants. We are laying down railway lines through the habitat of the elephants. We are digging up canals through the habitat of these Asiatic elephants and reservoirs are also constructed. And all these are the reasons why we see that even this 5% of the original habitat of elephants remain fragmented. But the biggest problem is laying down of power transmission lines. Power transmission lines which are laid down through the habitat of Asiatic elephants. That is the biggest problem that we are facing right now. And that is what this newspaper article is talking about. 461 elephants have been electrocuted in country in eight years since 2009. And recently we saw an unfortunate accident as well where more than four elephants were killed by the speeding train. And that is why this becomes a potential question for your examination. Let's look at few other details. We have reserve in Eastern Ghats, Western Ghats, Nilgiris. And these three areas are spread across Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And this reserve is primarily what we call Asia's Elephant Empire. And it is in this Asia's Elephant Empire that we see more than 10,000 elephants reside. But even this reserve, even this Asia's Elephant Empire is in conflict. And this conflict is because of electrocution. How? Farmers in these areas, in order to save their fields, what they do? They erect fences. And then they electrify these fences. How do they electrify these fences? They electrify these fences so that their crops are saved from wild animals or animals. They erect fences and electrify them using high voltage alternating currents. And when wild animals, particularly elephants, they reach this area, they get in touch with these electric fences and ultimately they die of electric shock, they die of electrocution and that is how we lose these more than 400 or close to 500 elephants since 2009. What is the solution? The solution is that instead of using high voltage alternating current fences, what we should do? We should use battery operated electric fences. 
but these battery operated electric fences they are also expensive and if they are expensive then what is it that we require we need the state's intervention here we need the intervention of the government here so that these battery operated electric fences are subsidized by the government provided to the farmers so that instead of electrifying their fences using high voltage acs they use these dc operated or direct current operated electric fences now let's look at another important news on page number 7 of the delhi edition of the hindu it talks about the time is not yet ripe to revoke afspa says the chief minister of manipur mr biren singh what is this armed forces special powers act this afspa is a central law and this central law is used in areas which are categorized as disturbed areas which are these disturbed areas that means those areas where militancy is continuing where militancy or insurgency is ongoing and that area is declared as disturbed area by the respective state governments and when the area is declared as disturbed then armed forces special powers act is applicable in these disturbed areas but what happens under this afspa let's say for example afspa is an operation in jammu and kashmir under armed forces special powers act the army the paramilitary forces the police they have some special provisions they have some special immunities they enjoy large set of immunities under armed forces special powers act what are these immunities they can conduct search operation anywhere in the state even without a warrant issued by the magistrate that means even without the prior permission from the magistrate you can search any locality any building any house in this disturbed area you can shoot to kill even on mere suspicion that means you are suspecting that a group of people they are moving together and you suspect that they may be militants you can shoot them even to kill them and still no prosecution can take place because under afspa you enjoy the immunity that means you can kill individuals even on mere suspicion and you can arrest people even without arrest warrants as well many people argue particularly the human rights activists because this afspa is in force in some parts of northeast and jammu and kashmir they believe that this afspa is misused by the armed forces and under the garb of armed forces special powers act extra judicial killings have taken place custodial deaths have taken place fake encounters have taken place even rapes have taken place under the garb of armed forces special powers act that is why there is an increased clamor right now amongst the human rights activists that afspa is an inhuman law and that is why it should be deleted it should be repealed from jammu and kashmir and parts of the northeast but what chief minister of manipur is saying that time is not yet ripe for the removal of armed forces special powers act some of the editorials and columns from today's newspaper the first one is choked by smog and this is a newspaper editorial concerning the horrible air condition in delhi ncr region air quality index is repeatedly telling us that the air quality in delhi ncr is very severe that means air quality is so bad that it can be safely assumed that you are not breathing the air in delhi but you are smoking cigarettes in delhi and the problem in delhi will not subside soon why because the temperatures are falling in northern india so it becomes a conducive atmosphere for smog the problem in delhi is not only because of vehicular pollution the problem is also because of the stubble burning that is taking place in the neighboring states of punjab and haryana the problem is also because of urban waste vehicular exhaust road and construction dust power generation so on and so forth and in fact india has 9 of the 10 most polluted cities in the world who world health organization what it has said it has said that air pollution is now the new tobacco and that is what india should give high importance to that means india should now give high importance to this who 
warning about air pollution being the new tobacco. Recently, United Nations Environment Program, they released a report titled Air Pollution in Asia and the Pacific. And they said that in this Asia and Pacific region, only 8% of the population in these countries, they have access to the air which is of acceptable quality. That means 92% people in Asia and Pacific, they are breathing toxic air. And ultimately, it has a negative impact on the health of the individuals, particularly the elderly and the infants, the children class. What this editorial talks about, this editorial says that from an urban development perspective, what we should do, we should prioritize that people should more and more use public transport. We should make it difficult for people to buy more pub private cars. We should make it difficult for the people to use their private cars. How we can make it difficult for them? We can make it difficult for them by imposing more and more very stringent parking fees, by imposing more taxes on the purchase of the new cars. If governments delay this action on this very critical issue of pollution control, then public pressure must force them to act. This is what this editorial is talking about. Now let's look at another article. This deals with the position of the RBI governor. RBI deputy governor Viral Acharya, he gave a speech recently and this speech went viral. Viral Acharya giving a speech which went viral and in this speech the deputy governor of RBI was primarily saying that if the government, central government does not respect the independence of the institution of RBI then it is going to be very very difficult for the economy. And this speech went viral and then we saw for the first time the, govern, the central government used section 7 of RBI act where under section 7 of RBI you can consult the RBI and issue directive to the RBI and this directive will be binding on the RBI. That means using this section, you are trying to belittle the autonomy of this very important institution called Reserve Bank of India. This section 7 of RBI has never been used since independence but as per the reports in Leibniz and various other publications, we have seen that this section 7 of RBI has been used for the first time by the central government under which consultations and directives can be issued to the RBI which is binding on them. And it is in this context that this article is written and this article will be covered in great detail in your economy this week lecture. There is another column on antiquities, a catalogue of all that's valuable. This column is on page number 8 of the Delhi edition of the Hindu and if you go through the October 21 newspaper analysis, we have covered this antiquities law there itself. So you don't need to read this article. Now let us look at some of the prelims based questions. Number 1, which of the following tiger reserves is or are not in Odisha? Satkosia, Similipal because this is in the news today, Odanti, Sitandi. And the answer is 1 and 2. Utandi Sitandi is in Chhattis. Now let's look at a map based question. Which of the following are not part of the Indian Ocean? 2 and 3, they are not part of the Indian Ocean. They are part of the Pacific. Previous year's question paper, prelims 2013. Which of the following is or are the characteristic of Indian coal? It is having high ash content, yes. Low sulfur content, yes. But it has high ash fusion temperature as well. So first two statements are correct. The third statement is wrong. Now let's look at a mains based question. Write the answer in 250 words. Criminal defamation is an anachronistic colonial era legal provision that has been historically used by powerful individuals, corporations and governments to silence and suppress inconvenient speech should defamation be decriminalized. And here, when the answer question is straightforward, should defamation be decriminalized? You can either write in favor of criminal defamation or against criminal defamation. And here I have taken a stand that defamation should be decriminalized. Let's see how the answer should be written. In the last few weeks, and this is where current affairs is also to be linked into it. 
Women have come forward to testify about sexual harassment committed by powerful individuals have had criminal defamation cases filed against them. For example, MJ Akbar filed a criminal defamation against one of the women who accused him of sexual assault, Priya Ramani. Powerful individuals, institutions have been using criminal defamation as a tool to silence critics and thus enforce a chilling effect on freedom of speech and expression. This is how Anil Ambani's Reliance Group has been filing criminal defamation against every other news portal, which is critical of the Reliance's deal with Dassault. For example, criminal defamation has been filed against NDTV as well. In 2016, the constitutionality of criminal defamation was challenged before the Supreme Court, but the two-judge bench of the Supreme Court, however, upheld the constitutional validity of Section 499 of Indian Penal Code. The court had, there was a petition filed in 2016, wherein the Supreme Court was asked that please declare that defamation is not a crime. And to understand that, you need to know the difference between a civil wrong and a criminal wrong. And this we have discussed twice in these current affairs lectures. So why should defamation be a crime? Why is it a crime against the society? How is this a crime against the state? But the Supreme Court said no, it will remain a crime. Why? Because Section 499 strikes an appropriate balance between a right to free speech and a right to reputation because both these are fundamental rights. But if you look at the global picture, countries around the world had been steadily decriminalizing defamation on the basis that criminal law was a disproportionately severe infringement of free speech, especially for what was essentially a private wrong and could be addressed by a regime of civil defamation. We are not saying that defamation should not involve any costs, but it should be a civil wrong. It should be a civil case. It should not be a criminal case. Countries that have decriminalized defamation recently include UK, which is the drafter of our penal code, Kenya, Lesotho. African Human Rights Court had emphatically ruled that criminal defamation was inconsistent with basic international human rights standards. It is therefore clear that across the world, more and more countries are acknowledging that modern democratic nations do not jail people for things they might say about others. India is no different. Our constitution guarantees a right to freedom of speech and expression, which can only be restricted by a reasonable law. Our Supreme Court, most recently in its judgment on Aadhaar, has held that an essential facet of reasonableness is that a law must not infringe rights to a degree greater than it's strictly necessary to achieve its goal. In other words, if there exists an alternative mechanism that can also achieve the goal without compromising on individual liberty to such a degree, the impunged law must be struck down because we have an alternative. We are not saying that defamation should not involve costs. But defamation should continue as a civil wrong, as a civil case and not as a criminal case. Criminal defamation, which is targeted at punishing what is essentially a private wrong, a wrong that one person commits upon another rather than upon society, is a stark example of a law that disproportionately affects the freedom of speech. That is what you should write if a question on criminal defamation is asked in the examination. That is it for now. Please fill the form if you need any assistance from us. Thank you for being with us. Have a great day.